All right. Hey, what's up, folks? This is Mr. Ippolito. A big shout out to all of Mr. Ippolito students who are watching live. And to those of you who are unable to watch live, if you're watching the recording after the fact, it is a pleasure to have you here as well. This is the Mr. Ippolito uh, quarter three Manifest Destiny unit exam review. Uh, so once again, very happy to have you here, uh, either live or watching the recording. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start out. I do want to give folks just a, a moment, another moment or two to jump on to the uh, to the YouTube live broadcast. So if you want to go ahead and put your name in the chat right now, let me know who's watching already. We do have some folks watching live. Uh, and so I would love to give you a shout out before we uh, before we jump in and get started. I do have uh, monitoring the chat next to me, the lovely and talented Mrs. Ippolito. So hello, Mrs. Ippolito. Uh, she is just off camera, my, uh, <laughs> my, my silent moderator over there. Uh, so once again, thank you so much. Drop your name in the chat. I would love to uh, love to give you a shout out. Also, uh, if you could, in addition to dropping your name in the chat, I would also love to hear your questions because every YouTube Live uh, that we do is always driven by your questions and what is uppermost on your mind. So, uh, so I definitely want to uh, I want to hear what you have to say and uh, are curious about what is like like I said, what is uppermost in your mind. So, going to go ahead go ahead and give a, a shout out to uh, Faith Givens and Samara Arun. Welcome. And uh, to anybody else who may be watching, who maybe just is a little too shy to throw their name in the chat. Uh, but once again, I would love for you to throw those questions in there. Uh, I am going to start off. I did get some questions from Melanie, who was not able to be here live, uh, but uh, she's going to go ahead and start us off because she emailed me some questions in advance. Uh, the first question is, why did the Westward expansion leave us with a sense of unity? Uh, and so, Melanie, if I were... Uh, if I were looking at my study guide, and I'm not sure where that is, I could just be I could just be missing it. But I'll go ahead and uh, I'll start off by answering your question. Uh, I think that uh, one way that westward expansion left us with a sense of uh, unity, maybe maybe it was unity of purpose. Uh, I think there were several Americans who were uh, were feeling that you know, like we said, that term manifest destiny, which means there's something deep inside of us. Uh, it, it, the United States was a very deeply Christian nation in the 19th century, the 1800s. And so there perhaps was some sense of unity of purpose uh, that we are destined to overspread the continent, right? As John L. O'Sullivan said in those primary sources that we looked at, the Mexican War primary sources, that we are destined to overspread the continent from uh, from the Arctic to the tropics, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so perhaps that brought the country together. I would also argue that I think this time period manifest destiny also was starting to tear the country apart, uh, particularly over the issue of slavery, right? So slavery was that big, uh, that big hot button issue that kept getting, uh, getting pushed more and more to the front of national politics during that time. And I would say that particularly with the United States entering the Mexican war, uh, again, another one of those, um, uh, those primary sources that we read, we read the President Polk article, uh, which was very much in favor of going to war with Mexico. We read the John L. O'Sullivan uh, editorial in the in the newspaper, which again was very pro getting involved in the Mexican War. But we also read the poem by James Russell Lowell uh, titled "The Mexican War Is on Behalf of Slavery" or or is all about slavery. I forget the exact title, but basically he was critical, right, saying that you are. Uh, you're basically sending your uh, we're we're sending our young men in the form of soldiers to die uh, in in pursuit of slavery, in the pursuit of extending and and uh, grabbing more land for the purpose of of extending the the slave power in the United States. So I think on the one hand, it was able to bring some people together in the United States. On the other hand, I think it was also kind of really starting to show our divisions because this is happening simultaneously with the next unit we're going to be learning about, which is antebellum America, the time period leading up to the Civil War. And so what we're going to learn about is all of those things, the way that North and South kind of pushed apart uh, during this time in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, ultimately leading to the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. All right, well, Mrs. Ippolito, I still don't see any questions. Uh, and so uh, if, like I said, if you're uh, if you're jumping, uh, jumping on the chat, and uh, I see that there are 12 people who are watching live right now. So if you're jumping on the chat, uh, please feel free to give me a question. If you're unable to, if you're having any trouble with the YouTube, uh, YouTube chat function, uh, sometimes you need to be logged in uh, with a YouTube account, you need to create a YouTube account. If that is 
causing you too much difficulty, you're welcome to go ahead and email me uh, those questions as well, and I would be happy to uh, answer them. In the meantime, though, I do have Smara. Thank you so much for throwing out this question. Could you please go over the U.S. Territorial Acquisitions Map Activity? I would be happy to, uh, and let me go ahead. You know, Mrs. Zippolito, I... Uh, I should have loaded this up in advance. It's going to take me just a moment uh, to uh, to just load this up because then what I'll do is I will load it up into my iPad so that way uh, we can have it. I can actually draw on it and I think that, that will be. I have my uh, I have my review sheet all ready to go, uh, but I don't have my westward expansion map. And uh, Samara, that is a good a good thing for me to have for you here. Uh, and I just need to get that loaded up. Uh, all right. So let me, this is one of those things that I probably should have had ready to go for you. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any other questions, happy to, to, uh, answer those for you. I am now grabbing the, uh, the territorial acquisitions map, and I'm going to go ahead and actually smear it while I'm loading that up for you, if you wouldn't mind, um, do you specifically, Samara, do you want to go over the map, the front side, or do you want to go over the back? Because that's, um, I think that will, that will help kind of guide if you're wanting me to go over, I'm just not sure, uh, growth of, all right. Okay. Uh, and then the question from Bella Oh, here we go. Okay. Well, this, uh, okay. I've got this rocking and rolling now. So Samara, I'm going to get this loaded for you in just a moment. And in the meantime, I can answer Bella's question. Bella asks, can you go over the question? Why could the California gold rush be described as meteoric? And I absolutely can. So let me go ahead and for the purpose of this, uh, do a screen share here. And you are specifically referring to question number 10. Uh, how, there we go. How can we describe the gold rush as meteoric? Well, one of the things, this is sort of a callback to quarter two when we talked about the life of Tecumseh, right? And we talked about the life of Tecumseh as being meteoric, meaning it's like a meteor. In other words, a meteor, this is my drawing of a meteor here, as it is falling to earth, uh, it burns very brightly. Uh, and then very, very quickly, it's all done, right? So meteoric means you burn very brightly or you have great impact for a very short up amount of time, a short period of time. And then all of a sudden it's done. So the gold rush, was meteoric because it had great impact starting in 1849 that was when you had thousands of people immigrating into california right that's why we call those the 49ers and for a brief time you have some people who are getting very rich off of gold most people the ones who are really earning the most money and doing the best financially during this uh time period are the ones who are making money off of supplies right supplies and uh, providing goods and services for those 49ers, those gold miners. But it, you know, by the early 1850s, uh, that gold had pretty much dried up. And so that's why we would describe this, uh, the California gold rush as meteoric. It burned very brightly for a very short period of time, and then it was done. So, um, and, th and then I think, Samara, you are asking uh, the back, yes. And so I think, if I can think quickly enough on my feet, and if I attach this correctly, then uh, there it is right there. And I'm going to download this as a PDF. And there it is. Okay. So now I just need to send this over to my iPad. Downloads. Okay. Well, there it is <laughs> and you're welcome bella all right so sending this over to my ipad i'm going to go ahead and uh temporarily stop my screen share so that way i can get back here and i'll be able to load that paper in just a moment the digital version of that paper anyway and thanks for your patience this is you know always the challenge of going live is you're never quite sure uh, what to expect. All right, create a new note. And we're going to load that there. Okay. So now I think if I have done this correctly, and let me go ahead and do another screen share. 
And all right, I think we're in business now. So Samara, uh, this is uh, this is what you're talking about specifically. And let me go ahead and while I may not be able to go over all of this, um, I can definitely sort of go ahead and get you started. So um, Samara, where I'm getting this from, I'm not getting this from textbook page 332. That was the old textbook, right? Although you still have, uh, let's, to be clear, you still have this old textbook, right? So you could use that. But if you go here, that's the um, that's the document that has basically like the answers to all of this, right? So if you go into Google Classroom, uh, it says Westward Expansion. And so all of these answers are here, but essentially this region is the, um, this is the land from, let me just go ahead and make sure that I'm calling it the right thing. The The document that you're looking for to get, you know, the source document is called U.S. Territorial Acquisitions, 1783 to 1853. It is in today's Google Classroom. It was in last class's Google Classroom. So this is 13 original colonies, for example, right? Writing kind of quickly. And then the next one, 1783. If you're scrolling down, this is Treaty of Paris. And then the next one, 1803, what land did we acquire in 1803? The Louisiana Purchase and so on. So, um, and then, so here, taken as a result of declaring independence from Great Britain. Mrs. Zippolito, I should make a note that next year, if I don't go over this in class, I'll make a video on this too. Uh, because that's I'm realizing now that we never went over the answers to this. And so <laughs> so that's why we're taking a little bit of time right now to do it. Uh, recognized by Britain in the treaty. This was the Treaty of Paris, but you can just call it the treaty that was signed after the American Revolution. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase purchased from France for $15 million. And then we're going to go ahead and we can skip over uh, Northern Dakota Territory. So 1819, this is going to be Florida. I'm just going to call it Florida. It might be called Florida Purchase. Uh, ceded by Spain in the, uh, this is the adams onis Treaty, or you could just call this another treaty. There we go. Uh, 1845 is Republic of Texas, or we could just call this the Texas Annexation, or we could just call it Texas. Uh, annexed by an act of the United States. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what answer I was expecting to be there, but um, 1846, this was the, um, these were the adjustments. What do I want to call these adjustments? Uh, this is when we we negotiated. Oh, this is the Oregon Treaty. So this is the Oregon Treaty with Great Britain. Uh, and the territory was settled at the 49th parallel, right? So uh, then 1848, this is the Mexican session. And again, I apologize for writing kind of quickly, but I want to get through this. Uh, seated by Mexico in the, this is, we can just call this a treaty. Also specifically, this was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but I am not going to make you memorize Guadalupe Hidalgo, but that was the name of the treaty. So this is basically what's the name of the land and then how did we get it, right? And then finally, Gadsden Purchase, purchased from Mexico so U.S. could build a railroad. That was the purpose of buying that little strip of land. Now, let me just show you because I think it's much more effective to actually show this to you on a map. I think that that brings it much more to life, right? So this is all of the land that we were talking about. This is the... This is the map that you colored. Now you cannot print one of my maps, right? Or you, excuse me, you cannot just go and print a map out. But what you can do is you can take the map that I gave you in class and you can mark, uh, you know, you can mark it up however you want to. So for example, if I wanted to put, this is where the register of the desert is located, right? Then that's the kind of thing that you might want to include as you are marking up your map. You may also want to include something like, here is Independence, Missouri. I think I told you that currently, based on the exam from last year, Independence, Missouri. Last year, there were 10 questions. There were 10 
map questions. Will there be 10 map questions this year? Maybe, maybe a couple more, maybe a, a couple fewer. But these are, if you jot these down, this is an open note quiz as long, excuse, open note exam, as long as they are your notes that you have created and anything that I have given you, any handouts that I have given you in class, that is, is fair game. Uh, one more thing, if you were going to mark for example, uh, the end of the Oregon Trail. Maybe that's one of the questions that I might ask you. So the end of the Oregon Trail is going to be right here in Oregon City. End of Oregon Trail. So there were various things that we learned about. And so you can mark those down on your map. One more thing uh, I'll mark down. This was, this is the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. This is the end of the Mormon Trail, right? You learned very recently about the Mormon Trail and the reasons why the push-pull factors, the reasons why uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, moved, left their uh, their previous location here in Illinois and uh, traveled along the Mormon Trail out to end up in Utah Territory. So that, I think, is going to be valuable for you to have on your map. Um, and then while we are, just so that I can finish answering Samara's questions here because there were a few more here. Which two regions were acquired as a result of war? Uh, well, you could say the original 13 states or original 13 colonies. That land was acquired as a result of the Revolutionary War. The Mexican Cession was acquired as a result of the Mexican-American War. Somebody could be very, like, you know, very specific, and they might want to say, well, Mr. Apolito, uh, Texas was acquired as a result of the uh, the Texas War for Independence. If you want to put Texas in here, that's fine, too. Uh, that would be okay, also. And then I think you there's also an argument to be made. The Treaty of Paris, like this land that we got from Britain after the Revolutionary War was over, you could say that that was acquired as a result of war also. So there's a little bit of wiggle room here on number one. Number two, which region was an independent nation for nine years before joining the United States? The only thing that could be the correct answer for that would be Texas. So I'll go ahead and write down Texas. Uh, California, we were the Bear Flag Republic, but we were only the Bear Flag Re Re Republic for about two months. We had our independence for only two months. We're our own independent republic uh, until being absorbed into the United States. Uh, and then finally, which land acquisition brought the land you're on right now into the United States? Well, let's go ahead. If we're talking about the land where we are on right now, let's go back to this map right here. And if we were to put an X right here where Rio Norte Junior High School is, I'm going to do my best to mark where we are. It's right about there, Rio Norte Junior High School. And therefore, Rio Norte is right there. We are in Southern California, which means we were acquired. This land was acquired in the Mexican session. So if I were going to answer that question, then I would answer it by saying, let me switch back to my pen colors here. I would say Mexican session with a C. Because that word session comes from the word seed, which means to hand over land peacefully. That's one of your vocab terms. Okay. And then finally... Uh, mastery question number two, that's going to be up to you to decide, but I can tell you the six flags over Texas. The six flags over Texas represent the six different nations, the flags of the six different nations that at one point or another uh, controlled the land that is today Texas. So uh, those flags are Spain and France and the United States, Mexico. Republic of Texas. They were their own independent country for nine years. And then the last country was the Confederate States of America, or we can just call them the Confederacy, because during the Civil War from 1861 to 1865, they considered themselves to be their own sovereign nation uh, in rebellion against the United States. We'll learn all about the Civil War uh, in, uh, in the Civil War unit. Okay. And then this, you're going to go ahead and answer on your own. So Samara, you gave me quite a challenge there to fill in a lot of information, but hopefully that helped you to fill in all of that. And then we will go ahead and this is the reward for students who were watching the review. They could go over all of this. Um, and and I, it's worth pointing out. I'm not going to show you the map side, but I think it's worth pointing out. I did mention that I will give you 10 points. Uh, this is an optional assignment, but I will give you 10 points if this assignment is completed. Uh, so that can it can only help you. It can't hurt you if you don't do it. It can only help you if you do complete it. Okay, uh, Mrs. Apolito. I think I'd like you to go over question 10 under Texas. And oh, absolutely. Okay, let me go ahead and let me switch back. And 
uh, go back to the study guide and zoom back out. All right. Faith, let me go ahead and go to number 10 under Texas. Why do you think the Texans declared independence from Mexico in 1836? Do you believe their cause was a good and just cause? Oh, my goodness. Well, Faith, uh, this is very much a... Uh, uh, this is kind of uh, your own uh, your own opinion, right? Your own informed opinion. Uh, I think you know we we did discuss uh, for a, a fair amount of time right after the Alamo. We talked about the answers to those questions uh, and the the movie The Alamo. Really, kind of that was our vehicle for learning about the history of the Texas uh, Revolution, the uh, Texas War for Independence from Mexico in 1836. Uh, do you believe their cause was a good and just cause? I, I think that's really up to you to decide. Uh, on the one hand, they were. There are many similarities to between the Texians who were fighting for independence for their own country and the revolutionaries that were fighting in the Revolutionary War in, in this in 1776. Uh, on the other hand, there are some people who have pointed out that one of the main reasons why they wanted independence was so that they could more uh, easily continue the practice of slavery. And so um, some people would say, no, they are not honorable. Uh, they were trying to circumvent the rules. They were illegal immigrants into Mexico, right? Because Mexico made three simple rules for them to follow. Number one was become citizens of Mexico. Number two was become uh, convert to the Catholic Church. And number three was to not bring in their slaves. And uh, when these Texians, when these Americans immigrated into Texas, they violated all three of those rules. Uh, and so uh, really, honestly, at the end of the day, Faith, this is going to be, uh, it's your its your opinion. Uh, whatever you can, whatever claim you're going to make, you just want to back it up with evidence. So I hope that was a, a good enough answer for you, Faith. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Zippolito, what do we have next? Uh, it would be my pleasure. All right, Jotin, that's a great question. Uh, we talked in various classes, and I couldn't even remember which discussions we had in which classes, but we did talk about push-pull factors for all four of these. But Jotin, I'm fairly certain we did not talk about it in period one, which is your class period. So California missions, and let me back up just by saying, just as a review, because push and pull factors most certainly will be on this exam. So if you are studying push and pull factors, you are like this you are smart to do so because i have definitely emphasized these so let's talk specifically about push and pull factors for the california missions why so push is why did they leave and pull is uh what was what were the positive factors that were pulling them in so i don't necessarily think that these spanish missionaries who left spain i don't think they were necessarily leaving for a negative reason i would say that perhaps the push for these spanish missionaries was uh, there was no one left, no one left to convert because missionaries, the whole purpose of being a missionary is to go to some other land, to some other place to convert people who are not of your religion and convert them and turn them into, convince them that they should follow your religion, right? So uh, so the fact that they were coming from Spain and Spain, which of course is largely a Catholic country, still is today, uh, they there was perhaps no one, you know, there was no no more challenge anymore. And so that could have been a push factor to push them out of Spain. Uh, and of course, a pull factor was the fact that there were in California, I would say a couple of things. First of all, beautiful weather, right? Beautiful weather, beautiful climate in California. Uh, and so uh, back then, today, land prices, uh, real estate prices are very expensive. Uh, we have a housing crisis in California back then. No housing crisis in California. So <laughs> so it was definitely a draw for those California, uh, those Spanish missionaries who were building missions in California. But I, I would also say an even bigger pull at that time was the fact that there were uh, thousands, right? Thousands of Native Americans. And if you are of the belief that like the Spanish missionaries were, that these Native Americans, that their souls were in need of saving and that they were not Christian and therefore they needed to be converted to Christianity so that their souls will be saved and you are scoring points for God, whatever whatever your motivation is, that is going to be the pull factor, right? The pull factor to go into California is going to be uh, that abundance of souls to be saved, right? People to be converted to Christianity. And you know what, Jotun, I would go ahead and compare that to uh, Oregon country. 
if you hear noises in the background, that's my dog, Bella, who is uh, being, no, she's just being playful. It's all good. I would say the push-pull factors for the Whitmans. We've talked before about Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. They were Christian missionaries who moved to Oregon, right? And so I would say their their push-pull factors are going to be exactly the same as the push-pull factors of those Spanish missionaries, right? Again, they are moving to Oregon. Their pull factor is the fact that the Cayuse Indians, the Native American tribe that occupied most of the Oregon territory at that time, uh, the Cayuse Indians, they were... I guess for lack of a better word, we're, um, I, I, this is describes more, this is really more describing a car, but convertible, right? I hope you understand what I mean when I say convertible. In other words, uh, they were seen, they were seen as convertible. In other words, they, they are not Christian right now and we should convert them to Christianity was, I think, the view of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. As it is the view, I think, even today, we have there are missionaries. If you've ever gotten a knock at a door, uh, at your front door, and someone has uh, wanted to speak to you about uh, Jesus or speak to you about their particular religious views, those are missionaries, right? You ever see them uh, riding their bikes and they're wearing white shirts and ties? Uh, those might be Mormon missionaries, right? And they... The, the goal of all missionaries is the same, to try to reach souls and to try to convert people to their version of whatever Christianity they are or what, whatever other religion it might be. So um, I'm going to say that that's a pull factor for any kind of missionary, whether it was the Whitmans in Oregon country or whether it was the Spanish missionaries in California. And I think um, that's really all that we need to say about that. So, Jotun, I hope that helps you. Mrs. Zippolito, are we all caught up? Right on. Okay, well... Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead then, uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women, because that's what I've been pushing all along. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, until somebody else asks a different question, I will go ahead and just kind of go through these. And then, of course, if you still have a question, please feel free to throw it uh, into the chat. And I'm uh, I'm not seeing any email questions, so I'm just going to jump right in. Number one, who built the first Spanish mission in California? That was uh, Father Junipero Serra. Uh, if you were in fourth grade in California, then very likely you uh, you did a mission project or you learned at least a little bit about Father Serra. Uh, Junipero Serra, originally from, I want to say from the island, Mississippi, do you remember that island? It's uh, just off the coast of Africa, controlled by Spain. I forget the name of that island. Anyway, uh, he is Spanish, but he was from that island uh, and then made it his life's work, uh, as do many missionaries, to go ahead and you know go forth and uh, and convert people around the world. So uh, that was he was the guy who went ahead and uh, and he was a Spanish missionary. Describe how the Native Americans were treated at the missions. Uh, not very well, right? Not very well, and I would say uh, pretty close to being treated as enslaved labor. So not very well. They really couldn't leave. Uh, so they were practically like enslaved labor. Uh, the missionaries just believed that they were doing God's work. And so they I think that's the way that they justified it. What was that, Mrs. Zippolito? Yeah. Oh, yes. Could I go over? Oh, right on. Okay. So uh, first of all, could you talk more about the map questions that could be on the test? Yes, I will go ahead and uh, pause my discussion of Gold Rush Missions, Mormons and Women uh, to talk about the map questions. So my best advice that I can offer you, and you can see that I'm showing you a map here right now uh, on the screen. Best advice that I can offer you is this. You should definitely do the practice questions because the practice questions the questions that are on the real exam are going to look, they're going to be in the same format as the practice questions that you can go into formative right now and you can practice. Now, just to be clear, those aren't self-grading, right? So I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not grading those. I'm not going in as you practice late into the night or over the weekend. I'm not grading those, but it's simply for you to get practice in what it's like to kind of draw that red X, right? The best way I think that you could prepare for those types of questions is just to kind of think of what are some of the major things that we have learned about? What are some of the major things that we have studied uh, in this unit? And go ahead and draw them on your map. You have a map. You have a map that you will be allowed to. It's an open note, your notes, anything that I've given you, plus your own handwritten notes, you can bring into this test. So for example, I'm going to tell you what will not be on the test. I'm not going to ask you 
where was the capital of the United States during 1776? That's Philadelphia. That's right there. Uh, but am I, am I going to ask you that? No, because it's not relevant to this unit. Might I ask you where American blood was spilled on American soil? I might ask you that question, right? We talked about that. We learned about that when we learned about the Mexican-American War, and we learned specifically about that boundary dispute. You remember we we had this conversation in class? I'll just refresh your memory. This right here is the Rio Grande River. It is the current, it is the modern boundary uh, that exists between Mexico and the United States with Texas there on our southern border, uh, this part of our southern border with Mexico. However, when Texas declared its independence in 1836, uh, Texas and Mexico could not agree on what the southern border of Texas was. So uh, Texas, the Texans believe that it was the Rio Grande. This is this this river that I'm pointing to right here, Rio Grande. However, the uh, Mexico believed that it was the Nueces River, which is right about there. We went over this in class, I think in just about every class, the Nueces River. And so all of this land, let me go ahead and pick, no, not orange, that would be bad. Uh, let me go ahead and pick pink. So all of this land here ended up becoming disputed land, right? Because this was land that was claimed by both Texas and by Mexico after Texas declared its independence. And so uh, during that time period from 1836 to 1845, when Texas was like, can we come in? Can we come in? Can we come in? Uh, and they wanted to get, they wanted to become a state of the United States. And Congress was very reluctant because there were a lot of Northern members of Congress who said, you know what? You're just going to become a slave state. And then you're going to increase the slave power in the United States. We don't want you. And so there was this back and forth, back and forth for nine years. <clears throat> Finally, the United States did annex Texas just a week or two before President Polk took office in 1845. And then that's when the trouble really began that started put, kind of pushed us closer to the Mexican-American War because troops, American troops started moving closer to the border and Mexican troops started moving closer to the border. Pardon me while I get a little drink of iced tea. And so both sides started moving into this disputed region because both sides claimed it, right? Both sides, this is disputed land. And so both the United States and Mexico claimed this land. And so troops get, kept getting closer and closer until finally there was a flashpoint and there were shots fired. And somewhere, that's a little bit tough to see, somewhere down in here, we're, we're never quite sure where it was, but somewhere American blood was spilled on American soil, even though it was disputed soil. But President James K. Polk was convinced that it was American soil. And that was enough to uh, ask Congress to go to war. Uh, and Congress agreed, although there were some people who voted against going to war, including a young congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. But uh, Lincoln was the one who said to Polk, you know what, you go ahead and tell me, show me on the map where it is actually American soil. That was the dispute. So that is going to be where you want you want to put that on your map. If that were a map question, if the if the question was asked, where was American blood spilled on American soil? So uh, I'm hoping that Nene, whoever you are, Nene, uh, I'm hoping that that helps you. And I do hope that all of you who are listening and watching right now will take a moment to jot down some of the significant places that we have learned about during our course of study. Many of them you see right here, um, but there are others as well that, you know, I've the too, too numerous to mention. Plus, I don't want to give all of the answers of the test away, but um, hopefully that will be a, a good starting point for your study. Uh, and then the next student asks, is that the next question? Could you go over the Texas questions? I certainly can. We're now on a roll, Mrs. Ippolito. There was a while when just nobody was asking me questions and now I got plenty of stuff to talk about. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, answer these. Number one, why were Americans moving to Norte, Mexico, Texas and settling there? Well, I think uh, this is best answered as we were watching the movie, right? They were they were moving there because there was timber, there was game, there was cattle, there was wide open spaces, there was cheap land. Uh, or if you remember the words of Sam Houston, 640 acres of your own choosing, right? So either free land or cheap land, free or cheap land. Uh, very fertile soil. P parts of Texas are good for farming. Uh, other parts are desert. <clears throat> but the 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 sweetest parts of Texas, the ones that were 
let me kind of move back, move back here for a moment. The parts of Texas that were closest to Mexico, let me use a different color here. This was the part of Texas, this part right here, that was the part of Texas that these Americans were moving into. And so they were going there because of the good land. This is, these would be pole factors, right? The good land timber, which is trees. It's it's wood from trees so that you can cut down those trees and you can turn it into a cabin. Um, that's why they were moving there. Those are the pull factors. And I think also to a certain extent, freedom, right? Freedom to practice slavery the way that they wanted to. Uh, freedom to kind of do their own thing and live their own lives and uh, just kind of be be out on their own, right? So uh, I think if you recall from the movie, again, the, the movie reflects a lot of the historical reality. Um, I believe it was William Travis who said, uh, Texas, Texas has been a second chance for me. Perhaps it has been, or perhaps it will be for you as well. In other words, for many people moving out West, whether it was to Texas or to Oregon or wherever they happen to be going, that new place that they were going to was a second chance to start over. Maybe they had committed a crime. Maybe they uh, were in debt. Maybe they just were lacking an economic opportunity. Maybe they couldn't find a job or maybe they got divorced or whatever the case may be. I think for many people, uh, this is for either for families or for individuals, this is a second chance. It's kind of a chance to reinvent yourself, start over and, uh, and create a new life. So that's going to be my answer to number one. Number two, the main leader of the Texas army, that was Sam Houston. Uh, number three, the commander of the Alamo forces, that is going to be William Travis. Again, everything we need to know from uh, from Texas history, we uh, we went over in those uh, those Alamo notes, right? In what city is the Alamo? What was the Alamo used for over the years? Uh, it was in San Antonio. As a matter of fact, my family has visited. I showed you those pictures. My family visited. We visited uh, Texas, visited San Antonio and the Alamo just a few years ago. Uh, it was used at various times as a church. It was used as a fort. It was used as like a lookout post. Uh, but it was sort of at this crossroads, right? That's the that's the the reason why the Alamo sort of became this central location to the conflict in the <clears throat> Texas War for Independence is because it was at this this crossroads, literally a crossroads where all these different roads uh, going into Texas converged. Describe what happened at the Alamo. Well, there was uh, the uh, the Texans forted up there, right? Texans or the Texians, they forted. And they just sort of were hanging out there. Pardon my messy writing here. They forted. Uh, and then eventually it was uh, the Mexican forces, Mexican army, that would lay siege to them. So remember, this was siege warfare. Now, in siege warfare... If you watch my vocab video, then you'll know all about siege warfare. It's when you surround a fort or an encampment or a village or a city or a town, and you basically fight what's called a battle of attrition. So in other words, you have them surrounded. They cannot go anywhere. So the bigger army, the surrounding army, in this case, that was the Mexican army, you just sort of hang out, you encircle the area, and then you just wait and you wait for them to either run out of food or run out of water or run out of toilet paper or run out of patience or whatever you're waiting for them to run out of, right? That is a battle of attrition. Sometimes uh, teenagers fight battles of attrition with their parents, right? In other words, you'll be like, can I go out tonight? No. Can I go out tonight? No. Can I go out tonight? No. Can I go out tonight? Oh, fine. You can just, you can go out, right? You just wear your parents down until finally they say yes. So uh, a war of attrition is kind of like that. You wear down your enemy just because you just, you are willing to wait longer. You have more patience. And so in this particular case, you remember that the siege at the Alamo lasted for 13 days. And then after the 13 days, after the Mexican army under Antonio Lopez de Santana, they felt that they were ready, uh, ready to attack then. And they had enough troops, enough men, enough cannon, and they were kind of calling the shots. They, it was, it was an attack on their terms. And then finally they attacked the Alamo and killed every one of the defenders of the Alamo, the women and children, they survived. Uh, but anyone, any of the Texians who were defending the Alamo were killed. Where did the Texans get their revenge? They got it at the battle of San Jacinto. Remember the Battle of San Jacinto, that was the battle that lasted 18 minutes. And Sam Houston, uh, remember, he was strategizing and he said, you know what? 
Uh, Santa Ana is like the, he considers himself to be the Napoleon of the West. So I'm going to defeat him by defeating him using uh, Santa Ana's own hubris, his own uh, arrogance, right? Santa uh, Santa Ana decided he was so amazing and he had so many men in his army that he was going to split up his armies. Uh, and that was the way that he was going to go after Sam Houston. And ultimately, Sam Houston was able to beat him because he split up his army. Uh, what was their battle cry? cry? Remember the Alamo. I'm not going to write it all out. Remember the Alamo. Uh, define annex. To annex is to peacefully take over a piece of land. That's exactly what happened. Finally, in 1845, Texas was waiting a long time for it. But finally, in 1845, uh, the United States peacefully took over the land of Texas. It was by Texas's request, peacefully take over a piece of land. That is what it means to annex. Uh, and that's why it is called, let's see, is it called the Texas annexation on this map? It is called the Texas annexation. That is what that piece of land is called. Okay. And then finally, question number nine, uh, why didn't the United States annex Texas for nine years? It was over the issue of slavery. Right. And this is this is the conflict. This is the conflict that's building. So from 1836 to 1845, <clears throat> the northern members of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives were trying to delay, delay, delay as long as possible, because, again, they know that Texas, because the Texians, the Americans who moved into Texas, were by and large coming from states like Kentucky, coming from Missouri, coming from North and South Carolina. Coming from, where did uh, Davy Crockett come from? King of the Wild Frontier came from Tennessee. Uh, and you'll notice the thing that all of these have in common, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, places like that, they are all slave states. And so uh, these many of these people coming into Texas are bringing in their enslaved people. Uh, and so it is almost a certainty that when Texas becomes a state, it is going to become a slave state, which sure enough, it eventually did in 1845. Okay, Mrs. Zipolito, we got about 19 minutes left. What's next? Next, we go over number four in Oregon country. Absolutely, yes. All right, so let's go back up to Oregon country. Uh, number four, who were the first Americans to build permanent homes in Oregon country and why were they there? Uh, we touched upon it briefly earlier in this review, but I will go ahead and write their names down. It is Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. They are husband and wife. And the reason why they originally settled in Oregon territory, actually in what is today Walla Walla, Washington, but it's Oregon territory, right? It's right, right up in this area here. Uh, and the reason why was because they were missionaries. And so they felt, just as I talked about before, they were missionaries who felt that they were on a mission from God to convert the Cayuse Indians, the Native Americans who were living there in Oregon territory uh, and uh, as we heard about in several presentations, because several people uh, chose Narcissa Whitman, uh, it did not end well for them. They they ran afoul. There was a disease that was going through the, the Cayuse uh, villages, and uh, I believe that they blamed, which, you know, uh, white settlers have, have brought diseases previously into Native American populations. Uh, and so whether it was the Whitmans or some other missionaries, we're not quite sure. Uh, but they, the Whitmans got blamed for the disease and uh, they were, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman were both murdered. So those were the first Americans to build permanent homes in the Oregon country. Uh, and that's why they were there. Okay. Did we go over all the Texas questions? This is what we did. Yes, I just finished that. And all right, well, I'm going to check my email again just to see if uh, I don't have any questions on email. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Okay, well, what do I want to go over? Oh, I did say I did say that I was going to finish going over Gold Rush missions, Mormons and women. And since I've got 17 minutes left, I think I could probably, can I talk about history for 17 more minutes? I probably can. Yes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> number three, this question is sort of an outlier. And honestly, students have, have asked me uh, what's going on. I couldn't find this. And I think I just may have put it in there accidentally, but it is still a valuable question. Why were Northerners opposed to the Mexican war? Uh, it is because they believed, they believed the purpose of the war was to extend or expand slavery, right? They believed it was all about slavery. And really, they weren't wrong, right? It was 
Texas was brought in uh, as a slave state, or was secured as a slave state after the, the end of the Mexican-American War. Uh, the New Mexico and Utah territories were open to the possibility of slavery. California did come in as a free state, but um, they were definitely like they, they were right to be concerned that uh, the Mexican War could potentially open up more land for uh, for slavery. And I'll, I'll also point out that at this point, this is where the rise of the free soil party takes place and the free soil party they were uh abraham lincoln was a member of the free soil party their whole platform was uh opposing the extension of slavery so that slavery would not slavery was fine they argued in the places where it already existed in states like kentucky and tennessee and alabama mississippi arkansas florida georgia you name it but that it should not be extended any further uh okay who was joseph smith he was the founder of the, I'm going to put the LDS Church. LDS stands for Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, um, uh, more commonly known as the Mormon Church. Uh, but he was the founder of the LDS Church. We talked earlier about uh, why did his followers move west? Uh, this is a push factor, right? This is the push factor for the Mormons. They were experiencing religious persecution. So you'll recall, I talked about this in several classes. Uh, you'll recall that. One of the beliefs that they had, they, they took very seriously from the Bible, was go forth and multiply, right? In other words, go forth and make lots of babies. And so there were leaders like Joseph Smith who thought, well, you know what? If if I have one wife, then I could probably make four or five or six or eight or ten babies. But if I had more than one wife, two or three or five or ten, I think Joseph Smith had a total of 40 wives, I think, uh, then you could make plenty more babies. And so that would be fulfilling God's mission to go forth and multiply. And so that's the way that they interpreted scripture. Uh, and so that was uh, that was something called plural marriage, right? Plural marriage or plural marriage, also known as, I think you, when you read it, I think you read it as polygamy. Polygamy is the practice of having more than one wife. And so in uh, LDF, LDS belief at the time, they do not still, the, the LDS church still exists today. They do not support polygamy or plural marriage today. Uh, but at, at their founding, when they were just starting to kind of grow as a church, they did support that. And so other Americans uh, really did not support that and thought that that was not a good idea. And so they uh, challenged the Mormon leaders like Joseph Smith, and they eventually threatened him and eventually they killed him. And so it was at that point that they decided, you know what, rather than face religious persecution, they just don't understand us. We should just go ahead and we should move West. And so like many other pioneers moving West, they have different reasons for doing so, but their reason was specifically because of religious persecution. Who led them to Utah? Brigham Young. If you have ever heard of BYU, that is Brigham Young University. That is the Mormon University uh, located in Provo, Utah, named after the leader who brought them, who fulfilled Joseph Smith's uh, vision after Joseph Smith was murdered. That was Brigham Young. Um, what challenges did the Mormons face? Well, it depends on what when we're talking about. They, re they faced religious persecution when they were in New York or when they were in Ohio or when they were in Illinois. But after they left, they faced the challenge. Once they got into Utah, right, which I believe they called that land Deseret at the time, it will later become Utah Territory, and then it will later become the state of Utah. Uh, but it was a desert. So they faced the challenge of trying to find water, trying to find resources. Uh, but part of the reason why people moved to the desert, we talked about this in class, in several of my classes. Uh, and this is true for my cousins uh, who live out on... East, East Palmdale, 170th Street East. Why do people move out to the desert? To Acton, to Agua Dulce, to Nevada, to Arizona. A lot of times it's just to get away from it all, right? And it could be cheap land. Um, real estate certainly is less expensive the more out like away from civilization you get. But part of the reason I think for my cousins is so they can go four wheeling and so they can fire their guns and so they can kind of do their own thing. Uh, and I think for the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons who traveled along the Mormon Trail, ultimately to get to Utah territory, I think Utah meant freedom for them, right? It meant religious freedom. It meant that they could do their own thing and kind of be free from the rest of civilization, and they could create a civilization of their own uh, based on their belief system. So 
Okay, and then shifting gears, where in California was gold discovered? So I had lots of students say, well, Mr. Ippolito, am I supposed to say Sacramento? Am I supposed to say Coloma? Am I supposed to say Sutter's Mill? Well, you can say any one of those you want because it's all correct. It was near Sacramento, near Sacramento. It is specifically in Coloma, California. We have been to Coloma, California. That is not too far away from uh, Sacramento. And in Coloma, California, that's where you'll find, and you can still find today, Sutter's Mill. It is a California historical landmark. You can check out the place where gold was discovered. Um, now, there are going to be some of you who say, well, Mr. Ablita, I learned from somebody's presentation on the people of uh, Manifest Destiny that actually gold was first discovered right here in Santa Clarita at the Oak of the Golden Dream. So uh, that if this question comes up, then yes, the correct, the technical correct answer is Oak of the Golden Dream. However, the place where gold fever began, the place where the gold rush began was in Sutter's Mill. That's what kind of set off. That was in 1848. And that's what really set off the California gold rush that would come in full force in 1849. That's why those all those people who came uh, to look for gold were called 49ers. And then who were the 49ers? I think I just answered that question. The mostly men who were looking for seeking gold uh, in California. And of course, as we've previously stated, the people who gained the greatest riches were not those looking for gold usually. It was the people who were selling blue jeans like Levi Strauss or people who were selling shovels or pickaxes or whiskey or other goods and services. They were the ones who actually were the biggest winners because they knew that there were people flooding in by the thousands, hundreds and thousands into gold country. And then they were going to need goods and services. And so they were there to uh, to fill that need uh, and and provide those goods and services. Okay. Oh, Mrs. Zippolito, it is 7.51, and I have not seen any further questions come into the chat, have you? Oh, my goodness, yes, thank you. Sorry, it's, I, well, I do not, I do not mean, you know, I, part of it is I discuss this at length, I think, with all of my classes, but I will, because I do, I do enjoy talking about pioneer women, so I am going to talk about this, because number numbers 11 and 12, they do go hand in hand. So, Mrs. Zippolito, as you know very well, uh, because you are, in fact, a woman, um, the... Uh, we had this conversation in class already, the traditional role of women, if, you know, going back hundreds and thousands of years, right? The traditional role of women, um, wife, uh, keeping, taking care of the home, taking care of the family, taking care of the children. So that was the very traditional role of most women, which was that traditional role was taken on by most American women in the 1800s. Uh, on the East Coast, right? Most most Americans were living on the East Coast and then sort of eventually trickling out West. Uh, as women went West, whether it was on the Mormon Trail, the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, whatever the case may be, they had to, first of all, many of them were getting married young, right? And by the way, I should point out that if you have not yet uh, watched or read Gold Rush Missions, Mormon and Mormons and Women, you should, it's really good. Uh, or watch my YouTube video on Gold Rush Missions, Mormons, and Women. That is a really good video to watch as well. Um, but so not only are these women, they're getting married at 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, but they are also uh, getting pregnant, right? They're getting pregnant on this. So they're traveling. They're traveling with, while they have, uh, they're bare, you know, they they have a child inside of them. And perhaps they are caring for children as they're traveling west. And so they're having to travel, not in the comfort of a car or an airplane or a train. They are having to travel mostly on foot while caring for children or perhaps even carrying children inside of them. Uh, and then they are giving birth to these children, multiple children, caring for these children. Uh, giving giving birth to children was very dangerous. There were you don't you didn't give birth in a hospital back then. You either gave birth in a log cabin or you gave birth in a covered wagon, right? So these were just some of the, the challenges that pioneer women faced. Just doing the roles of traditional women. But add on top of that, uh, there were, so let's say, you know, eventually part of the reason why families had so many children, in addition to the fact that children died at a much higher rate uh, back in the 1800s than they do today, there was a much higher uh, child mortality rate back then. So you would have five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 children or more just because simply half of them might die uh, in early childhood. But part of the reason why you had a big family, a lot of children was to have help on the farm. 
right? So if you had a farm, whether it was in California or Texas or Oregon or whatever the case may be, you're having a lot of those children so that they can help the family farm. But until those children are old enough to start working the farm, who is working the farm along with dad? It's mom, right? In this in this sort of traditional family. And so women, in addition to bearing children, caring for children, taking care of a home, cooking, cleaning, doing all of those traditional roles of women, they're now also farmers as well. And so they might be out there after they've finished cooking and doing the dishes and caring for children and feeding children, they have also now, they now have to do field work to work the family farm. And then if we just go a step further and think, well, at some point they're going to need supplies, they're going to need tools, or they're going to need uh, flour for baking bread or whatever the case may be. Today, you can run to the grocery store, to Target or Walmart, and I can be back. I can run to Target and back. Well, it depends on Target's kind of a fun place. So sometimes we spend a little while in Target, but if I know exactly what I want, I can be to Target and back in 20, 25 minutes, right? Getting what I want. Back then, if you're going to go to a trading post because you need a shovel or you need a pound, a five pound sack of flour or whatever, that's going to take days. And so typically the man would get on his horse and ride for two or three days, perhaps to go to the nearest trading post to get whatever supplies or to get their mail, whatever the case may be. So during that time, during that two or three or four or five, or maybe even 10 day round trip journey, Who's caring for the home and the children and the family all by herself? It's mom. Who is defending the home from rattlesnakes, from mountain lions, from bears, from rats, from all of the wildlife, perhaps bandits or other hostile forces that might want to come onto your land to take take advantage of your land or take advantage of your home or take it, you know, do something, do harm to you or your family. It was mom who was defending. So now moms, women, are not only having to do the traditional role of women, which is to care for the home and care for children and, you know, cook and clean and all those things. And not only are they having to farm, but now they're having to wield a shotgun to defend their home against wild animals and wild humans. So pioneer women had to be really tough. And so what happened, and this is what, this is answering questions 11 and 12 kind of simultaneously here is over the course of the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and forward into the late 1800s, women proved, women, pioneer women, proved that they were not just as tough as men, not that they couldn't, could do what men could do, but they were in some cases tougher than the men because they could do more and they did more, right? So, uh, so I think it is for that reason that women in the West seem to gain rights more quickly than women of the East Coast is because women of the East Coast, for the most part, were kind of confined to those more traditional gender roles of cooking and cleaning and taking care of the home and taking care of children and taking them to church. Um, whereas pioneer women really did have to do it all and often play the role of the traditional woman, but then while also playing the role of the like the father of the family too, when the father of the family was gone or if he died, right? There was a higher mortality rate for men uh, than there was for women. And so women really did have to do it all. And for that reason, uh, women in the West got voting rights and other rights faster, uh, property rights and voting rights among them uh, faster than the women of the East. Two more questions. Okay. Dallas is on the test. Do we just say gold seekers or should we specify that it was mostly men? Oh, um, well, I don't think gender matters all that much. I think it's probably good to know that most of those gold seekers were men, but I don't I don't think that matters too much, Bella, but that's a good question. You can just say gold seekers. You can say 49ers. You can say people in search of gold. But yeah, it was mostly men. Although there were women who uh, who sought their fortune as well in uh, in California and during the gold rush as well, uh, providing a number of different services, laundry services and uh, saloons and, you know, other other services that uh, that they were providing as well. Well, Jot and I can tell you this. Uh, some of these require some precision, right? So like if I'm asking you specifically, <clears throat> where was American blood spilled on American soil? Then if you want full credit, you got to mark, you got to put your mark in Southern Texas right there, right? If you put it up here in Northern Texas or Central Texas, I'll give you a half point, but this is kind of more of a, that's a very specific thing. So this is my tip for you. But sometimes it's, uh, it's just general, right? This is the the area that Jefferson bought from France was the Louisiana Purchase. So put it there, put it there, 
put it there. It's all the Louisiana purchase, right? So sometimes it's very broad in general. Other times it's a little bit more specific. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. Uh, if I ask you where the California gold rush was, for example, I think I mentioned this in class before. If you say, well, California, the gold rush was in California. And then you mark, let me pick a color that's going to stand out here on this red. If you mark California, but you mark it down here in San Bernardino, then I'll give you half credit, right? But that's not where the gold rush began. The gold rush began up here near Sacramento in central California. So if you mark it closer to in the part of Northern California where it actually was, then you're much more likely to get full credit as opposed to maybe half credit for just like uh, somewhere in California, right? So it, uh, some some of these are gonna require you to kind of pinpoint exactly where it is, others, not so much. So Jotin, hopefully that helps. Right on. Well, and look at that, eight o'clock straight up. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share. And so uh, just wanna give a big shout out. Thank you to everybody who jumped in uh, live tonight. And uh, thank you for all your great questions. Uh, and so looking forward to period one, your uh, your test is going to be tomorrow, uh, Thursday, February 16th for all of my periods, four, five, and six classes. You're going to be just after the four-day weekend. So uh, the advantage that you have is a little more time to study, but the disadvantage is more time to forget. So uh, if you're period one, just make sure you're uh, you're getting a good night's sleep tonight, periods four, five, and six. Um, I would recommend maybe spreading out your study over the next few days so that you don't uh, you don't forget it all. Uh, and then just do maybe a final review on Monday evening before our exam on Tuesday. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to give a big shout out to Mrs. Zippolito. Thank you so much, Mrs. Zippolito, for monitoring the chat and for just being wonderful as always. And uh, folks, thank you uh, for, for jumping on, whether you're live or whether you're watching the recording. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to invest in your history knowledge and your history learning. And good luck with your test whenever you may take it. Have a great evening or whatever time it is right now. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time in our classroom. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.